discuss that in the data step backs as a concern as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then for the reading, uh, the concerns about reading capabilities mm -hmm. at the high school level, obviously students aren't arriving in high school without prior education. So what are we doing to address this? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is an administrative question. What are we doing to think about addressing this on the middle school level and the elementary level if we have this many students who are coming in without the ability to process a word problem? I can speak to what's happening at the high school. I can't speak to the middle school or the elementary schools. And unfortunately, we do have students that are arriving to us, um, transfer students in from other schools, states, or countries mm -hmm. that haven't attended school for many, many years. Um, so we do have, we will always have um, a group of students like that. Sure. But we have started reading seminar last year and this year at um, the high school. We're almost doubling our plans to offer additional sections. We're hoping to uh, increase significantly the number of sections moving from ninth grade to ninth and tenth grade and providing the really targeted support and the different programs that each individual student needs through reading seminar. Plus, if all the content teachers are being trained with this keys to literacy, embedding literacy, reading, writing across the curriculum um, within the content of each course and discipline, that absolutely should help. I can't answer the questions about the middle or the high, uh, the elementaries. I'll jump in about the ele the um, the other levels. At the elementary level this year, we actually did professional development for all kindergarten through fifth fifth grade teachers in terms of high quality literacy instruction. Um, research-based strategies. You also know, the board likely recalls, um, in, in multiple presentations, we talked about MTSS and the process, that tiered support of intervention, the tier one being your core program, high quality professional development, fidelity of implementation, fidelity of implementation, um, also looking consistently in terms of tiered resources that we have in place. Um, at all levels. So Mrs. Gariello talked a little bit about some of those interventions and um, at the high school level, at the elementary level, you likely recall that the board supported um, one reading interventionist at each building. Th those individuals, again, using data from our screening tools um, are working with tier two groups of students in small group instruction. Um, similarly, it's also about having research-based intervention programs to support those students who have a demonstrated need for tier two or tier three interventions. At the middle level, um, we have um, taking a look at our, our research-based interventions and continuing to actually increase those so that we have those supports available. This year, we are continuing with reading interventionists at each middle school. You know that currently at the middle school, those are supported through ESSER funds. Um, certainly, that is something that we continue to investigate in terms of, of potentially including those as budget priorities in the future. Um, if they come to fruition, certainly that's something you'll hear about this spring. So I think that gives you a sense of um, what we have in terms of the core as well as those intervention supports at the elementary and middle school. Also at the middle school, I want to say we do have um, an intervention course for our students who have that demonstrated need in ELA, particularly in seventh and eighth grade. Okay. Thank you. And then I guess, um, well, one suggestion I'll just throw out in addition to Ms. Ford's really good suggestion about the parent groups. Um, this is far easier said than done, but it seems to me that maybe the idea of parent peer tutors, in a sense, mm. um, parents reaching out to other parents, parents who are engaged, and I know we have many mm -hmm. uh, who are really engaged and might be willing to reach out to a family that's not engaged or maybe would be intimidated by being in a room full of administrators and not mm -hmm. what questions to ask or not feel comfortable asking those questions. Um, so it's just an idea. And Thank you. Again, I know. Easier said than done, but I think we'll it might a be uh, an interesting thing to try. So uh, finally, I, I guess just you know comment as I see all of this and kind of try to pull out the story, some storylines from all of this data. And um, you know, I wish <laughs> I could say it was a it was a happy storyline, but I, I think if we put a lot of things together here, or if I put a lot of things together here. 
students not taking screeners seriously, uh, ninth graders not wanting to be uh, in room with other student mentors, um, parents not being engaged and not really responding to the, our attendance going to 80%, one out of five students not regularly attending, right? That's a story of culture. <laughs> And as we say, as the, the cliche goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. We can have all the strategy that we want, but it seems to me that there's, this tells a story of a culture that where the motivation and the incentive is not there. And I don't think the answer, frankly, is to incentivize students to take a screener by giving them, I don't know, what, pizza parties or candy? I mean, I'm, I'm not being facetious, but right. I think that's a really dirty game. <laughs> and I don't think that's a route that we should necessarily go down. I think if we're doing this right, because if we do that, then that sends the message to the students that what we value of you is that you take this screening test. That you've, you know, if you're a ninth or tenth grader, you've taken multiple times before, and you're probably a little unmotivated to, mm -hmm. to participate in it, right? And I think we can do all the explaining that we want, but I don't think that really is going to resonate either. <clears throat> so it comes down to culture. Mm -hmm. It comes down to a culture of motivation, of saying that, you know, this is what we do because this is what we do. And I know there's a lot of really good examples of that at EHS, um, but in terms of, you know, what the, the issues seem to be here, I just... You know, there's no response. I don't need a response, you know, to this. But I do think that we have to address culture along with strategy or else we're not going to get anywhere. Or we're going to paste over certain issues and we're not going to get to a broader uplift of the entire institute. Absolutely agree. And that's one of the purposes of bringing in the Hornet Homeroom and the SEL lessons and the, you know, the principal advisory meetings and the, like, you know, trying to give students voice and, Yep, we're trying. Yeah, and I appreciate you are trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also appreciate and respect all the hours of work that went into this plan. I really do. And I, I applaud everybody that contributed. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Whitney. Uh, Ms. Klotz. Hi. Hi. So um, I am jumping on with everyone else. Thank you so much for the presentation, all of the work that you guys have done, the entire group. It's just it's a lot of work, and it is appreciated. Um, also, Mrs. G, I know it's not easy to stand there and answer questions on the fly and to just be graceful about it. So you've done a great job of that, too, and thank you. Thanks. Um, most of my questions have been asked and answered by all of my colleagues. Um, just a couple of things. So as far as the parent workshops, this is a great idea. Um, I would like to see it opened, like, perhaps through all the different schools. I, I really think this could be, just make a huge difference in our entire district. Um, you know, maybe on top of what everyone else is saying about the, you know, maybe a business sponsoring it, um, things like that, maybe offering multiple times and dates to the families that are specifically invited. Um, I know scheduling is difficult mm -hmm. just throughout the district. Um, people have jobs and different shifts. So, I mean, availability, I know for myself, it's hard um, coming to some of the evening meetings and the conferences. So, you know, maybe that would help. Um, so there's that. Um, as far as the mentor group, I'm wondering, like, do you think that the mentoring group might be able to be, I don't know if enlisted is the right word, but um, to be utilized to help promote attendance somehow, um, you know, or help with reading or something like that, because they are peers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that would be something. Um, let's see. And absences, have we spoken to the students themselves, the ones who are missing? Okay. We have, and our okay. student advisors have done a phenomenal job, as have our, the assistant principals. Um, because they deal a lot with the attendance issues and truancy issues. And um, we meet about this weekly and collect data um, and collect information. We do a lot of check-ins and check-outs with students. Um, we have a list of students that we're, you know, we're trying to motivate and get, get to the root cause, get to the reason why, um, and then try to provide help and supports and strategies and resources to get those kids to school. So, yeah. Is there... Are there like two or three like main reasons that you hear that children are missing school just over and over? Or those reasons, I mean, over and over? Um, it's a variety of, of reasons. Um, it, it's really specific to, to the students. It's not one real common th theme. Okay. Um, it, it really is individualized 
to the, the family and, and the situation. And didn't I just say it's hard to answer questions on the spot? And I'm just putting on the spot. I apologize. So excuse me for that one. Um, so also, just one more thing. I agree with my other colleagues about maybe tabling this, if that's a possibility. So and thank you sure. so much for answering my questions. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ms. Klotz. Are there additional questions? Mr. Kelly? Um, I, get quick. I, was, I, I love what you guys put together. Um, the, I think coming in, the students feeding in from the middle school to kind of echo Dr. Whitney, and this is why I won't point the. Um, to talk to the mic. There you yeah. go. Mr. Hey. Kelly, would you, could you talk into the mic? Sorry, please? my apologies. <laughs> um, I, was, I was trying to echo Dr. Whitney's um, call with uh, the involvement of the middle schools because I, I do think it's a very important aspect. The Algebra 1 is a very early course for most mm -hmm. high school students. Um, and or they're taking it in the middle school. So is there, um, are you guys tracking if the students are ready for Algebra 1 by the time they come to you? Absolutely. Um, with growth scores and? Absolutely. We have predicted scores from the state to see how, they, how students should do. We have the screeners from the middle schools as well. We have the grades from the classes. Um, we know what classes they're taking. Um, Yes, absolutely. So the, only, the only thing that I thought um, as I read through this was just where the middle school's involvement is with it. So in terms of the placement process, the middle school teachers moving from eighth to ninth grade, um, they are the ones that are making the recommendations and placing students after looking at a huge amount. As a matter of fact, they just went through this process last week. Huge amount of data, including the screeners, including PSSA scores, including test scores, uh, teacher feedback is critical. Um, it takes hours and hours and a lot of data review and looking at, you know, IEP needs or specific needs by student, individually, student by student. So there's been an awful lot of time. The middle school teachers have done a phenomenal job because they know the kids. We don't know those students yet. And so they spend an awful lot of time making course recommendations. And were they, were they able to, or was there like a level of prediction that you guys had of, of these scores being as low as they were? We weren't so surprised between all the different things that we were talking about um, that I mentioned. Right. Yeah, we were aware that there were quite a few barriers. Um, okay. Yeah, with a couple groups of students, you know, moving through. All right, and, and the middle school involvement with uh, preparing them for the Algebra One course, you feel as though that's something that doesn't need to be addressed or brought into the, this plan? So I can't speak to exactly the curriculum or what they're doing down there. I can speak to their placement process and then really knowing their students well and knowing what they needed. Um, obviously, we're recommending and requesting a course that is not an algebra course. It's a math course. So we're seeing a need for some students, but just a few students, not hundreds of students. Um, so obviously, we are requesting something else in addition that we need at the high school. So we're seeing that gap. And would they they be taking the keystone right after taking the foundations course? No. Then going out. No. Um, what we're proposing, and Mr. Mahalik will explain it in detail, but foundations course, if the students need it, just for certain students that, you know, the scores are showing that they need more time. Um, and then they could go into what is our fundamentals course, which is essentially a pre-alg course, then algebra, and they take the, the keystone at the end of their algebra. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I do also like the idea of, of tabling it, um, just to be able to kind of digest some of the conversation that's been here and also for, um, there was public comment for the last, uh, for LMMS that people were able to come in and talk about. So. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Additional comments, questions from the board? Mr. Flaggy. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. Absolutely. It was it was great. Um, I kind of got everything I needed from my colleagues here, so thank you for asking all the great questions. Uh, the one thing that did stick out to me, and I want to thank you, is the parental involvement part I saw of it. Um, going through this, I'm like, this is what we need. Mm -hmm. right? We need to start getting all parents out there involved in helping their kids, guardians, neighbors, grandparents, whoever that sister, brother, whoever that person might be. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, to Ms. Bowman's point, I'm sitting down doing third grade math, and I'm like, oh, well, this is a little <laughs> confusing to me the way this is being done right now, right? Because it was 13 plus 13 is 26, not 10, 10 6. Carry this, do this, do that. But anyways, I just wanted to thank you for that part of the presentation. I thought it was great putting it in there. Thank you. And I'm also on board with Ms. Bowman and some of my other colleagues here. I'm probably tabling this for public uh, review and comment at the next meeting as we did with LMS. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Falegi. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Uh, the, the parental involvement. Yes. The, our district does a lot of yes. parental involvement. Is there much attendance that you see? So we're basing um, our numbers and our goals, the SMART goal, off of conferences, parent-teacher conferences. Last year, my first year at MAS, we had 472 conferences. That's not families, that's conferences. And very often, if a family comes, they'll come to three, four, five conferences. This year, we were in the mid-600s. So we increased, but in the grand scheme of things, that's still not a lot for the size of our school. Um, our parent advisory meetings that we hold each month have a good, a really good ones, about a dozen parents that come. Um, and we have 2,800 kids at our school. So we really would love to have significantly more parent involvement. Um, so those, those are the numbers that we're kind of working off of, um, conferences this year and last year, and just... Even the internet safety presentation at, yeah. at, at the middle school, the, um, you know, I, I guess for me, Getting to it during the week is very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. But uh, is there a way to maybe film them and, mm -hmm. and, and be able to watch them at our own kind of Absolutely. Level? I will say we had about 1,500 people show up for the 8th to ninth grade uh, parent night, that transition night in January. That was very well attended. Yeah. And they brought the kids, which was wonderful. And it was great to see the 8th graders running around the building. Yeah, you guys did an awesome job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I second that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any further comment from the board? I'll just close by again thanking you for the presentation. Uh, I do think that this was a comprehensive overview, a lot of good ideas. Um, it is going to be, I think, a little more complex getting it to work mm -hmm. in the high school, to, to Mr. Smith's point. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a lot of my other questions were already addressed, but I will, you know, uh, chime in on the parental involvement aspect. I, I th again, I think it's a great concept. I think it's very challenging to get people to come in and participate. Yep. Um, so I'm not sure how to how to promote that more, but you know, I do think that parental awareness, parental involvement, is going to be important in order to to gain, make some of these gains that we're looking for. Agreed. Okay. Um, and if there's nothing further, you. Thank you very th much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to uh, ask a question, a uh, parliamentary question, Mr. Fisher. Um, the next item is to, uh, to, to pass the plan resolution uh, in order to uh, contemplate the, the, the tabling. Uh, do we first have to get a motion on the... Do one of two things. You yeah. can either put a motion on the floor and then somebody can move to table it. Okay. Or if you can sense the consensus of the board as well, just... Uh, direct the administration to simply put it on next next okay. meeting's agenda. Okay. Well then, it I'm really going to difference. wield my authority as president. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like there's a consensus among the board that we'd like to to put off the vote on the TSI plan uh, to the next meeting to to allow the community to further time to review and and, and, and provide comment. So I would like to direct the administration to uh, make sure we put that on on the next 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 meeting's agenda. And again, that's not to, uh, you know, we're not commenting on the quality of the presentation or what that. I just think it's, it's a good idea from a procedural standpoint. Okay, uh, that was item D. We'll move on now to, to item E. Um, Math Foundation's curriculum presentation. Uh, Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? Yeah, I'll be quick um, in my introduction. We have Mr. Mahalik here um, who's going to share an overview of the math curriculum that's being proposed. And so again, the through line of the order of our presentations is that you heard Mrs. Gariello and Mrs. Gamble reference 
the way in which the need has come about or has been realized. And so um, this particular course is being designed to address a need. And then it will we will follow with um, <coughs> what is typical standard practice in which first the presentation and then approval of the new curriculum. Thank so you. So I'll turn things over to Mr. Mahalik. Hello again, let's talk some math now. So it says math foundations, really uh, the work that we did recently was, was math foundations and fundamentals of algebra. We, we revised uh, fundamentals of algebra, that's kind of like the third phase, if you've been here long enough to know our, our math revision process, but uh, math foundations is a, is a brand new course that I'm here to talk about tonight. So first, the, the process, as Mrs. Gariel mentioned, there was a, a lot of meetings with the, the TSI committee, and from that conversation, uh, we had a lot of ideas about what we wanted to do and, and, and really kind of like got down to a root cause. And so we really wanted to slow down math for, for some of these students. So um, this was we had a lot of teachers involved in this process more than we normally do for a course that we're writing, which was a great thing. When we actually got down to the writing, um, Omar Haddad and Kira Kern are two of our math teachers, and they were the two teachers that wrote this curriculum. We then sent it also to the rest of the math department for feedback, as well as um, some special education teachers. So the, the way in which we went about this is, and if you if you recall, like in, in middle school, our, our students are all having to still take the grade level PSSA every year. So when they get to the high school, this is an opportunity to you know, kind of work on some of those those prerequisite skills without having the pressure of that state standardized test at the end of the year. And that's a really important part that I want to highlight. So we looked at the prerequisite skills that we felt like the students really needed to be able to eventually master the target skills, the target standards that we identified for Algebra 1. So for math foundations, just to see how this fits into the big puzzle, uh, students come into the high school. Um, these, the students that we're talking about tonight are students that are taking Math Course 3 in eighth grade. When they come into ninth grade, they have uh, there's several different options depending on their skill level. So we currently have fundamentals of algebra with the lab. We currently have algebra one with the lab, and we also have algebra one and the one two block. So a lot of different courses. What we're introducing now is math foundations, which would be another option. So we have an extensive rubric, a lot of data points, a lot of great data points. I do want to just speak to that real quick. We use PBOS, which is going to take all of their past standardized test data, give a prediction of how they feel these students should do. But we also have our local data, including iReady, including AMATH. We have drilled down into that. There is a phenomenal relationship between AMATH and how our kids eventually do on the algebra keystone. It's statistically strong. R squared usually like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, somewhere in there. So of all the data points that I've seen, that that's pretty good when it comes to a screener and an eventual uh, state standardized test. We can't say that it predicts, but there's a very good relationship. So we use all of that data to, uh, to give us a recommendation on what placement to put the kids in a ninth grade, but also there's that teacher feedback. So math foundations for students that would be going there, you can see that in 10th grade they would be, do, uh, they'd be doing fundamentals of algebra and then they would take most likely algebra one with lab in 11th grade. That's when they would take the keystone. But we might have some students that don't need foundations. They can go into fundamentals of algebra and then they would take algebra one in 10th grade. Again, that's when they would be taking the keystone. So this work, the foundations work, this course, we're not going to see how those kids do on the keystone for several years. So we're not going to see the growth for several years. Um, what we will see is how the kids do that go right into Algebra 1 next year. So this will be a process that we have to be patient and, and see how this all shakes out. Also, this current year is the first year that the recently proposed rewritten Algebra 1 course is being implemented. So that's another consideration as well. So we're really slowing down math for, for some of these students, which is fine. You know, the work that we did uh, with systems benchmarking, we felt like we can slow down math for, for some of our students, and that's exactly what we intend to do. So the curriculum for both math foundations and fundamentals of algebra is very similar, and that, that was the plan. We have three different units in both courses that really target some Algebra 1 target standards, including the number system, functions, and solving equations. And so really what we're trying to do is continue to build and spiral back on some of these prerequisite skills to really build that strong foundation. We also want to have a unit in each course that's based on geometry and probability and statistics. The reason for that is, you know, we're trying to figure out what's the best thing to do for these students. And a, a lot of these students would benefit from having geometry. But if you look at the, this, the course sequence, it's going to be difficult for those students to get to geometry. But we feel like this is a very applicable 
area of math that these students should have access to. But we also feel like this, talking to the teachers, that this is an area which students typically succeed in. So if we have the unit in geometry, we can build a little bit of math confidence for some of these students that have historically not had a whole lot of success when it comes to math. But it's also, it, it's engaging stuff. Prop stats and geometry, this is, you know, these are ways that we can get the students to really engage in math and hopefully see that it can be a little bit more interesting than not bashing algebra, but maybe a little bit more interesting than algebra. Mm -hmm. So the instructional uh, approach for these courses really is to, is to prioritize that conceptual understanding. Once the students have that, now we can talk about fluency, how to actually engage with a problem, know how to engage with that problem, and then hopefully how to solve that problem relatively quickly. But we really need to have that conceptual understanding, which is the priority of these courses, and then ultimately be able to apply that and solve problems. But it really is a step-by-step -step process that we need to, to focus on. In terms of resources, we now have with these, uh, these two courses, we have an idea of where we want to go. We don't have the resources picked yet as to how we're, or, you know, what resource we're going to use to get us there. But we really felt like the most important thing was identifying what are our target standards. And now, as time goes on, we will look to the best resource to help our teachers and our students. For IXL, that is a resource that we will continue to use. But that's a resource that is really meant to help the students with their individual um, their individual skills. So that's, it, you know, we have, might have a class of 20 kids and they might have 20 different needs. IXL will be able to uh, you know, have a diagnostic where we'll be able to figure out what those needs are. And that is a way for the students to work at their individual level. We're, so we're going to kind of do two things that, you know, not at once, but two things in the course. We're working on the, the, fundament or the fundamentals and the foundations of math, but we're also giving them the help in the areas that they need. And then there's additional support um, alongside the foundations and the fundamentals. Um, in math foundations, part of the class will be dedicated time for all of the students to, you know, to work on the IXL for the teachers to be able to offer dedicated direct instruction related to their needs. We'll also be able to do that in the fundamentals of Algebra Lab. All right, so for both courses, we have a plan for students to, build, to work on those foundational skills, but also get that instruction um, in areas that they need for students with IEPs, their IEP math goals, we'll be able to work on that. For students that don't have IEPs, they'll be able to work on their skills as well. So this will be in foundations. This does not have a lab, but when you look at the big picture, these students are getting more math instruction in the long run than they would have got otherwise if they just went into fundamentals. So if you're wondering why doesn't foundations have a lab, they're still getting more, more math instruction in the long term. But those students who go to foundations in ninth grade will also be able to, if they, if they do need reading seminar, they'll be able to get that reading instruction help in ninth grade because as we've heard before, there is, um, there, there's been a lot of discussion about these students and their, their, their reading levels as well. So big thing, you know, big takeaway, we're going to work on those foundational skills and continue to use IXL as we've been using the last couple of years to help them with their individual needs. And that's it for the, the two different courses. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you, Mr. Hollick. Questions from the board? Mr. Jankowski. So thank you for this presentation. Um, Mr. Kelly kind of started st stealing my thunder uh, with his line of questioning, um, so I won't I won't delve too deeply into that. But but my my my, my biggest concern that I find problematic and kind of same along the lines of what Dr. Whitney mentioned with literacy is why why are students being advanced in middle school and having to take a math foundation course in ninth grade? Um, it it kind of seems to be. It's almost like we're pushing students, just pushing students along without really addressing the issue where, where it seems to be stemming from, and that's, that's middle school. So I, I do think that's a big problem, that we're having to create this course. Um, I mean, it seems like they should be getting their foundation in middle school. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, is there anything being done to look into that? And, yeah. and what's actually being done in, at the middle level to make sure these kids are actually getting. Um, because, I mean, why are students, why are teachers saying, you know, students are ready to advance when clearly, clearly they're not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say the first thing is, is there stuff being done at the middle school? Absolutely. The math standards additional math, math time that those students have. So, you know, some of these students have been going through core level instruction and then also getting that math standards help. But what I said before is a, it's a really, I think, an important point. These students still have to take that grade level PSSA at the end of the year. So we still have to deliver that core instruction, that grade level content, whether they're 
ready for it or not. That's what we have to do for those students to have success on that. So this, I understand your question, but at the same time, it's also challenging just from a systems view that we still have to get them taking that grade level assessment at the end of every year. This is a unique opportunity, and hopefully this is not something that lasts forever, short term, because there's still a lot of implications that go back. There's a lot of layers to this problem. Uh, but some of these do go back to things that have happened with their foundational skills in math going back to four years ago. We all know, you know what that is. But hopefully this is something that eventually fades away. We don't have to, we don't want to see the numbers increase in the number of sections that we have for foundations, that's for sure. No, I, and I, I appreciate that. It just seems as though these deficiencies should be being identified in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and, and being addressed there and not just pushing the students mm -hmm. on to high school for you guys and the math teachers in high school to have to, to address. Although I do appreciate the course and, 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 and the opportunities that are being added with these. Number two, and this is kind of to jump in the gun on the budget, I do think, I mean, we have two teachers, two math teachers right now, I believe, that are we're using es ESSER funds for. Um, or, or support the interventionist. The interventionist. I mean, I think it's absolutely critical that you include that in your priorities. That we're able to have sufficient support um, for for these students. Um, so, I, I know you you had mentioned it earlier that that's something that may come up. But but I do think that's important that we we make sure that we're not losing any any support. So okay. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Mr. Smith? I'm just going to make it super brief. Um, full support for me on, on this. I think it's certainly needed. Um, I just wanted to express my appreciation that we um, listened to feedback from past presentations uh, regarding curriculum and that we um, included our special ed department in mm -hmm. developing this. That's um, a, a huge win for us, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Ka Ms. Klatz? Thank you for your presentation. So I'm speaking as someone who this would have benefited. <laughs> so when math, to me, um, started becoming very difficult when I was in eighth grade. So I can just see how many people this would, this would benefit. So thank you for that. Thank you for um, thinking outside the box and really reorganizing how the students will learn and come up with different ways to make it more interesting for them. So thank you for that as well. And um, just as a side note, I'm kind of wondering what exactly you don't do at the at the school because you do Jasper, you do the therapy dog, and, you know the therapy program and math as well. So kudos to you. And next time, can you please remember to bring the dogs? Bring the dogs. Noted. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ms. Klotz. Additional questions or comments from the board, Dr. Whitney. A quick question. Um, I just want to clarify my understanding. So. When the fundamentals of algebra are algebra one with the lab, <clears throat> that lab is an additional one credit, right? Mm -hmm. So those are two credits, correct? Mm -hmm. So is that, and, and those, and students that take the lab are the ones that need the additional help. Mm -hmm. They're identified as, so they're pushed toward that lab. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any solution to this, but I, I get concerned that, you know, that takes a credit away from a student to take a different course that, in their day that, they might truly, you know, thrive in, um, and I know we have to do what we have to do. But I don't know if, you know, if making this two full credits, if they have to take the lab, it's. I don't want to say it feels punitive, but it, it a little bit because then those students miss out on a, another course. Right. So, I, I appreciate that. I do want to make a quick comment about that. I think that was something that came up in foundations. Do we? We don't necessarily think it's the best thing for, for some of these students to get double math and nine, double and 10, double and 11. That might be a bit too much because there are a lot of other things that they would probably be enjoying a little bit more than that. Um, but I also would just want you to know that it would be really hard for me to stand here and say we're going to reduce the amount of math instruction given our, you know, our challenges. So yeah. here you, we, we certainly talk about that. It's just, you know, it's definitely one of the, the challenges that, that we're faced with right now. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you for the comment. Ms. Ford. Just real quick, two things. Um, I heard you mention the use um, of IXL, and I just was wondering, had any consideration been given to brilliant.org? They have great reviews and um, are trending. We'll, we'll look into it. I know one of the things that we considered, like our process with IXL, we did look into that as a team several years ago. Okay. And we're 
I'm particularly sensitive to all the different tools that we're throwing at teachers. So it was, you know, for, for us, we've been using this one for two years and there's some good data mm -hmm. to, to support this. And it's like, let's, let's get good at this before we decide to, you know, try something else. But we'll certainly look into that. Okay. Yeah. And one more kind of out of the box thought. With AI being coming so prevalent uh, and important, good and bad with it, any consideration given to harnessing um, AI to find best practices for teaching some of the things we need our students to embrace? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, we actually did talk about we did talk about AI when we had the curriculum writing day. Mm -hmm. We were talking just and how how AI does help teachers come up with more engaging problems that are unique to students' interests. So. If maybe that's what you're suggesting, yes, we've talked about that. So instead of the math problem that was written in 1980, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can definitely get things that are that are related to what kids are actually interested in that still focus on the math standard that we're trying to teach. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. and I appreciate everything you're doing. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Bowman. Yeah. Um, so the instructional resources have not been determined at this time. So I, I I'm just trying to understand what that means. Are you saying that in order to pull off this course, we're going to need an instructor, and so at a coming meeting, we'll find out all about that, or does it mean something else? It, it really means the actual, like, the resource. So, uh, like, think of it like a textbook. Okay. We don't need, the, we already have the teachers in okay. mind that are going to teach us. It would just be, like, what is the actual curricular resource that we would use to teach these different standards? Okay, thank you. That, mm -hmm. That's really helpful. And then just a comment. Um, listening to the issues of middle school math and maybe even um, elementary school math, I mean, math facts happens, what, third grade, fourth grade? I'm not sure exactly which grade they're, they're learning those. And, and then we're giving it to them again at some point in this class in high school. Um, it really does sound like for a, a chunk of our kids, the PSSAs are hurting them. Like they're, they're, they're caught up in this cycle where we have to teach them to the PSSA because we need them to excel in the PSSA. And so every year they're not getting what they need because we're teaching them what we need them to learn to pass this test or do well in this test. And then they get to high school and then we have to take a few steps back and give them this class. And I'm just wondering as a district if we can really take a step back and look at elementary, middle school math, especially this I, I'm assuming it's not all kids. Like we have, obviously we have kids who are taking algebra in seventh grade and eighth grade and they're doing fine. So to try to really drill into which kids are really being hurt by this emphasis and see if we can do something different for them. I'm going to... Are you okay? May I respond to that? Um, and I appreciate the question. And actually, after Mr. Jankowski's question, I actually wrote um, a note here to to respond to the the comments from the board, as as well as I think it's important for the community to understand um, that tonight was intentional because we were here talking about a, a designation um, from the P Department of Education based on our student performance on a standardized assessment. I hope and I think from the comments we received from the board, you realize that we're blessed to have a school team that really took a deep dive in terms of our data at the high school and attempted to identify what are where are our students performing well, where are they not, and what can we do differently, not because of that TSI designation, but what can we do differently to improve the experiences of our kids at the high school. You heard interventions that are academic as well as behavioral, as well, you know, when we talked about engagement, um, attendance, things like that. There were so tonight was really taking a look at addressing needs that have uh, have been identified um, at one particular level, but I I think it's important for me on behalf of my team to emphasize that you know Mr. Mahalik is part of our Office of Teaching and Learning, and he has three other colleagues who, when we're talking about a need that has been identified at one level taking a system-wide comprehensive analysis to say, okay, we're seeing this in our students going, in this case, it's from eighth to ninth grade, or we're seeing this particular need um, in, in high school algebra, right? But we certainly recognize the need didn't start there. And so it is about sort of looking comprehensively in terms of 
We are seeing needs at the elementary level. We're seeing needs at the middle school level. I'll remind the board it wasn't so long ago Mrs. Thatcher came and gave a presentation in terms of working with middle level math teachers and what they had identified and what supports they put in place. At the elementary level, we're taking a look at um, instructional minutes. Um, you might recall um, we had a presentation in which we talked about the need for consistent instructional minutes in math. Um, we are also now taking a closer look at our elementary schedule to determine how we might have a consistent intervention block for math as well as ELA. We use the acronym at elementary WIN, that what I need time. Um, it's for the most part primarily been devoted to ELA, but we recognize we have math needs. Um, so at the, that is, that I give that as one maybe not simple, but one example of how we are looking at those needs district-wide. Our grade level teams of teachers absolutely look at standardized assessment and screening data, and you're right, um, you're gonna hear actually as part of the budget presentation later, like one of the priority needs is for those curricular resources specifically to target fluency. Um, it is introduced at the elementary level, but if we have students who are not mastering whatever specific facts it might be, it follows them right to future years. And so there's the, the need for a resource to support that particular need. At the middle level, we also have, um, again, Mr. Mahalik talked to, well, I have referenced math interventionists previously, which are supported by ESSER funds currently, um, and also taking a look at those intervention courses that we have at the middle as well as the high school to support those math needs. So those are just some highlights to emphasize that as a team, this isn't just about, okay, there's a need that's been identified at the high, high school level, and so we're going to focus on addressing the need just there because we recognize that certainly there are changes that we can make in all the preceding level or in the preceding levels to ultimately support kids along the way, not just waiting until they get to that high school keystone course. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Campbell. Are there any additional comments or questions? Um, I'd just like to add, you know, math is fundamental. Um, so I think you know, making something available to, for our neediest students uh, to, to make up ground I think is important, um, and uh, you know it's just important to make that space, make that opportunity for those students. Uh, I think we've we've already you already mentioned that we already have identified the teachers who are going to mm -hmm. teach the, the the math foundations class. Okay, um, and this is potentially a temporal need, a temporary need. Hopefully, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, if there's no further questions, we'll move on to uh, item F. Um, this is a motion to approve uh, the Math Foundations uh, course that, we, that was just described, uh, in, in addition to uh, its synergy with, with the Fundamentals of Algebra class. Um, may I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Is there any additional comments or questions from the board? All right, very good. Uh, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falangi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine eyes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, the final item under curriculum is on the addendum to the Emmaus High School 2024-2025 program of studies. Um, is there an administrative presentation you'd like to do before taking the motion? I don't think there's an administrative presentation, but Mrs. Gariello, I think, okay. is coming up. I was just going to speak to, I was just going to speak to the fact that this is, um, it's, it's atypical for us to have an addendum to the program of studies. You just learned in terms of the rationale for the addition of the math courses, but there is an addition for several other courses, which we're really fortunate can be offered as a part of our continued partnership with LTRI-C. And so, Mrs. Gariello, I think you were just going to just briefly speak yep. to what those courses were. And I wish our high school students could have stayed to hear the great news, right, about they American Sign no Language. no idea. Yeah. So those young ladies who spoke had no idea that we were um, requesting and proposing this. So tonight we're bringing forward four uh, courses. And again, this is out of the ordinary. We usually like to do this in October, November. Um, but the one course is the Foundations of Math course. 
The second course is American Sign Language One. It is an asynchronous online course partnered with LTRIC. Um, it's only for juniors and seniors, and it would be an option um, in addition to our world language offerings. There's been a, a, a as the the student said, there's been um, a, quite a bit of interest in that. So we're excited that we have this opportunity. And then the other two courses are, again, because of the dual enrollment opportunities that constantly evolve and because of the state's um, encouragement for dual enrollment offerings, we um, have worked with LTRIC and we would like to um, provide a dual enrollment opportunity for our 11th grade honors English class. And um, we would still be following our curriculum, but incorporating some components from LTRIC. They do have some uh, possible requirements in terms of a placement test. Uh, the students do not have to take it for dual enrollment. That is an option, but at least it would be an option for them. Um, so we're really just adding the dual enrollment or the dual credit designation, dual credit designation for the 11th grade honors class. And then we would like to follow through in 12th grade with a 12th grade honors English class as well. Again, dual credit option, very similar a combination of our work that we do at the high school in addition to LTRIC's course. It would provide the opportunity for students in high school, at the high school, not have to travel there to LTRIC to have the opportunity to take a dual credit class at the college level. Thank you, Mrs. Gariello. Um, I guess I'll take a, a motion and then we can discuss. So moved. Second. Okay, are there any comments or questions from the board? Ms. Bowman? Um, I just had a question about how the ASL class works. So it says it's asynchronous mm -hmm. only. So there's no, the students don't have anyone that they can ask questions to? No, actually through the course, they have access to teachers um, it is asynchronous, so they'd have to email and, and wait for responses, but there is a human on the other line. It's not just videos or anything like that. Okay, I and mean, the reason I'm asking that is um, learning how to use your hands for ASL, like there's, there's mm -hmm. without that live component, I, I just, I worry a little bit about students having questions and not being able to show somebody, is this correct, you know, mm -hmm. with their hands. Um, that said, I'm really happy that we're offering this. Um, it's, it's a need, it's a need in the community. Um, I was trying to communicate with a, a, a deaf man at the hospital. His family couldn't even communicate with him. And mm -hmm. um, I, I knew how to say one thing in sign language and I did, and then he thought I knew how to say more, which was, <laughs> didn't, but, um, you know, I, I, I would hope that if we have high student interest in this course that we could expand it and eventually have it with a, um, you know, an in-person educator and have more than one course because um, it takes more than a one credit course to learn this and actually Certainly. be able to communicate. So I, I would love to, I, it, it would be a service that we'd be um, offering the community. I'm really happy that um, LTRIC has it. And also, if possible, if we could eventually expand, perhaps if they have other world languages that we don't mm. offer at the high school, we occasionally get requests for um, things, Russian, Chinese, um, mm -hmm. other things that we don't have teachers for, and it'd be great to offer online courses for those. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bowman. Further comments, questions from the board? <clears throat> well, I'm gonna add, um, there's just two points. I'm very happy that we can continue to leverage our partnership with LTRIC um, and uh, you know, to provide dual credit opportunities, but also to enhance the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember asking a question, I think it was five years ago, about potentially adding ASL as an option within the high school. So five years, but that time, I'm glad to see it to, <laughs> while I was still on, on, uh, serving. Um, so you know, I appreciate Ms. Bowman's comment that uh, you know having a live person is, is important but you know I think we need to crawl before we can walk and so I think it's great mm -hmm. that we're bringing this in there and uh, you know for even for students to even have a you know a rudimentary understanding of ASL and to build on something else thank you okay so any additional questions or comments okay seeing none Ms. Allen please call the roll Mr. Kelly aye Ms. Klotz aye Mr. Smith aye Dr. Whitney aye Ms. Bowman aye Mr. Falegi aye 
Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Um, okay, I'm gonna do something that I don't think that we've really done before. Uh, I'm going to actually call for a brief five minute recess so we can all take a little stretch break. I'm gaveling back in. Um, go ahead. All right. How was it last? Mr. Kelly, that's five demerits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to be sensitive to uh, Mrs. Ann Thompson's time. Uh, she's here tonight to uh, uh, discuss and, and, and support uh, the approval of uh, our, our approval of LTRIC's 2024-2025 uh, uh, budget. Uh, so that's actually under item 8B. Uh, prior to calling her up to the podium for, to say her words, I'd like to have a motion uh, to uh, to approve. So moved. Second. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. Uh, thank you very much. I think you'll have a piece of paper that relates to East Penn and LTRIC at your place. Um, and I'm fully aware that you get our wonderful budget book every year. And uh, I know from previous years, you really didn't have many, and you didn't have any questions about our budget. For those of you who are new, this is the tenth year we are not asking you for more money, <laughs> <laughs> which that's nice. Uh, our budget actually works on the value of the uh, properties. That's one of the budgets, and then the other budget is our operating budget and together that's how we come up with the total amount so it can vary from year to year but the total amount of our budget has remained the same for 10 years and this year you're really not being asked for any more money um i think it's important if maybe you weren't keyed into this the way i was in the newspaper Governor Shapiro has big plans for higher education. I presume you're aware of that. And basically, the idea is that there will be a board, and how this board is appointed, that's all under consideration at the present time. And under that board, there will be two other boards, one for the PASHI system, you know, the East Stroudsburgs, the all, all those schools. And the other board will be community colleges. And it is our understanding that the community colleges will have the same consideration that the PASHI does, that we'll have the same power in these under boards. And we will keep our own board at the individual community colleges. And what's important to you you still own us. In other words, the state isn't taking over the community college. You still own us, so the bad part is you'll still have to pay. <laughs> um, we, we do exciting programs. It's late in the night, but if I can be so bold, I, I recognize when people become juniors and seniors in high school, they're not so excited about coming to high school every day. So if you get them in our early college program, where they're actually going to LTRIC, or they're doing courses here and going to LTRIC, they will be a whole lot more interested in attending because they graduate from Emmaus High School and they get their associate degree from LTRIC so you have saved the money for two years of a regular college. Um, I think that's a way to get more kids into your rooms. Thank you. Did anybody have any questions? Thank, thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Are there any questions from the board? I actually have a, have a few comments. Um, and again, thank you very much for your service as our East Penn representative oh. and for coming here tonight uh, to, to talk in person. Uh, you actually started to touch on something that that uh, I wanted to get your 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 feedback on, and, and you know what can East Penn School District do as a participating district to foster um, you know LTRIC's success? Um, I think the uh, you know the 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 uh, 
you know, what, what you just mentioned about doing the early college program might be a way to, 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 to do that. But in addition, you know, I think we talked about some other things is le leveraging the dual enrollment aspects between the high school and LTRIC. Uh, but what else do, can, can you think of that, that East Penn could do to, 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 to uh, help LTRIC with its mission? Well, in reality, your guidance counselors and our, our person who comes and visits the high school have been really doing an excellent job in getting a lot more of East Penn students enrolled in dual enrollment. That, that is really very helpful. Um, we do have open houses that students can come and, and see what goes on that um, I, I know when I was on LCTI's board, we used to bring students there. And, you know, if you come to LTRIC in Snexville, it really looks like a college. Okay. Are those open houses announced in, in advance? Is that something that we can, we can incorporate into board meetings? When, sure, when we and we know the date. Yeah, we do. We do always announce them as well. But oh, yes. bring it to the board meeting. Sure. Okay. Thank yes. You. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for asking, because um, we're doing exciting things at El Tri C, mm -hmm. and I, I think we're very fortunate that we're really on the cusp of doing things that other community colleges will be doing soon, okay. <laughs> given the new supervision. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. If there are no further questions, uh, I'd like uh, Ms. Allen, would you please call the roll? Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen, and thank you again, Mrs. Thompson, for your time. Okay, uh, take, going back onto the agenda, uh, item five is on the budget. Uh, we have another uh, installment uh, on the 2024 budget. Uh, then this evening's on expenditures. Uh, Dr. Campbell, if you'd like to inter or, uh, introduce. Yes, this evening, um, as we transition to actually the, um, this is technically our third installment as you described it or um, session of our budget process in East Penn specifically tonight we're going to uh, take a deeper dive into the expenditures for the 24-25 school year this particular slide really again a reminder for the board and the public in terms of um, the roadmap and where we go for the remainder of the winter and spring again ending with a June 10th presentation and adoption of the final budget the next slide, we also just remind the board and the community of our goal in terms of providing ed, um, equitable educational opportunities, again, balanced with that financial responsibility to um, our community and our taxpayers and, and keeping our school district in terms of a good financial standing. And then you can see there the objectives that really guide us throughout the budget process, including um, maintaining our existing programs, taking a look at that tiered system of support. You heard me earlier tonight talk about MTSS. It's certainly a core of our work here. Um, sustain our funding for capital improvements, including the facilities plan and our realignment model. And then, um, again, having a strategic plan for thinking about those positions which are critical and have been able to be supported with ESSER funds over the past several years. And so at this point, Mr. Saul is going to um, begin with just, I think, a quick review of maybe some revenues, and then um, we're going to take a dive into the expenditures. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, the next three slides, uh, as Dr. Campbell referenced, are the revenue slides. These are extracted directly from the previous presentation, included here really for ease of um, reference. So if you need to go back and pull the information, you can just pull this slide deck rather than going back and pulling both of them. I did want to make one comment with regard to the state revenues. There was a question at the end of the last presentation with regard to the governor's proposal and what that would mean in addition to um, the amount that's budgeted. I did the math in my head and I had a misplaced decimal. The correct answer was 1.4 million. I think I said 140,000. So um, 
I just wanted to clarify that point because it is a significant difference. And we're, we're good when he makes those kind of mistakes, right? Because that's actually <laughs> that's like a, a lot mistake. more money than I thought. That, yeah, that so, seemed more, yeah. I was yeah. like, what? It's we're only... good, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, as Dr. Campbell explained earlier, this evening we want to talk about um, the expense part of the uh, equation or the expense part of the budget. Um, and while the expense budget, as you know, is made up of thousands of individual lines of expenditures, which then get summarized up, whether it's in our long-range plan or the document that we're required to do by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, um, what we did for this evening's presentation is really just boil it down to the major categories where the changes are occurring year over year so that we can look at those. And when you look at, again, whether it's the long-range fiscal plan or the PDE document, it's really hard to extract these by the way they're, they're laid out. Um, but I think it's easier for a presentation like this evening to, to sort of boil it down so we can look at those. So the first 14 items here, um, which I'll go through very quickly and then we're gonna go back in just a little bit more detail, but they're really related to um, continuing the educational program. So if we continue the educational program that's in place this year and roll that forward to next year, the first 14 items, those increased or decreased expenses um, are in play. And then, um, so I just want to go those quick, through those quickly. Those are wages, the insurances, uh, insurance benefits, um, social security, retirement, workers' compensation, which are all wage-related, wage other fringe benefits, um, the special education allocation, the curriculum materials and the athletics allocation, um, expenditure specifically related to grants, um, charter and cyber charter school tuition, uh, the LCTI tuition, property liability and cyber insurance, and transportation. So all of those, again, um, are related to just continuing the existing program. The next two items, debt service and transfer to capital reserve, um, you'll notice the note at the bottom of the of the slide that we have incorporated the uh, millage phase-in plan, the draft uh, plan that was uh, put together in October of 2023 um, for the K-8 to option two realignment. Um, that plan has been incorporated into um, this first draft of the budget. Therefore, there's uh, some adjustments to debt service and capital reserve. Again, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. And you can see that once we take all those items sort of, quote, off the top, we're left with all other expenditures. And you can see that, like, there's a negligible change when you collect all those other expenditures and put them together. Um, finally, um, district priorities get rolled in there for 24-25. And we strike a subtotal because if we're trying to compare apples to apples, all of those items compare year over year. The, the following two items that are below the subtotal, the use of um, the ESSER set-aside funds and budgetary reserve, really you can't compare, compare year over year, primarily because the ESSER offset funds are, are specifically spending fund balance. They're not really tied to, uh, to the revenue side of the equation. And budgetary reserve, as you'll recall, when we look at our long-range fiscal and capital plan, we back that out before we look at our bottom line. Um, so certainly you can compare uh, the totals, but I think if you're trying to make that apples to apples comparison, you want to look at the subtotal lines um, to, to look at that increase or decrease. Okay, I think we can dive into uh, a, a quick description of each of those items we've touched on. Um, I did give uh, each board member or each person up front um, a one page that includes slides seven and slides eight so you can follow along. We have some additional slides to share uh, with some graphical representations, et cetera, but we're gonna work our way right down through those expense items. Uh, so first, with regard to wages, um, the wage category uh, is comprised of the job classifications that are listed on the slide. Um, uh, Wage increases for a majority of employees are defined by a collective bargaining agree agreement or an administrative compensation plan. You can see that the composite increase um, for the wage category is roughly uh, 3.5 million or 4.79%. I think in terms of wages, it's pretty self-explanatory. Everybody can think about what that, 
what that is overall, and so I'm not going to really dig into that much more. Um, group insurances, the increase in this category is primarily related to the, our, incre our projected increase in um, medical insurance. Uh, the increase is projected at 5%. The premiums will increase at 5% for next year. You'll notice that the overall increase is slightly lower, three, about 3.25%. Three um, some of that has to do with uh, employees opting out of uh, um, health insurance coverage, which is, drives down the premium a little bit. I always... Pardon me. I always like to use this as an opportunity to remind the board that um, we do participate in a health insurance consortium with 10 other uh, Lehigh County school entities. It's called the Health Benefits uh, Consortium, and we use our, you know, we pull together to leverage our um, collective uh, purchasing power to negotiate um, better prices and plans um, for those entities. Um, currently, the Health Benefits Consortium has uh, 4,300 subscribers or contracts. A family would be a contract covering uh, 11,400 lives here in the Lehigh Valley. Um, we're actually at a point uh, through contracts that we've negotiated that 100% of our premiums go to actually pay medical claims. And the administrative overhead is covered by um, pharmacy rebate. So we were actually able to continue to negotiate with Highmark and get um, credit for the pharmacy rebates that they receive to cover our administrative overhead. So when we pay premiums, 100% of those premiums that we pay to Highmark are being used to, to pay for medical expenses. Um, in addition to the, I'm sorry, there we go. Uh, in addition to the, um, very low administrative cost. Uh, the, the type of plan we have is has an annual cost settlement feature. So any premiums that we pay in that, isn't, that aren't used to pay for claims get set aside by Harmark into a reserve fund. And we're given credit for that. Um, and uh, that's called a rate stabilization fund. We can use that to stabilize our rates. I'm sorry, I did get a little ahead of myself. I wanted to mention, you can see on this slide, um, the average increase over the last, um, I think this is 12 years, has been 5%. Um, and so that rate stabilization fund has been used. You can see there was a year that was a negative um, 6%, but has been used to try to stabilize the rates. We've actually taken a much closer look at this um, moving into the future. And we're really, I mean, I've talked about this with the board in the past. We're really going to make a, a conscious effort to try to continue to budget. You can see over 12 years, it was 5%. So each year, budget 5%. So there may be years that we're actually paying into that um, a little more than we need. But then in years where you would have higher need or higher, you know, higher premium increases, it would pull out of that. School district budgets, you know, it's very challenging to um, deal with the volatility of a 15% increase, as you can see there, and then have a 0% increase. It's just, as things jump around like that, it's difficult in a school budget. Whereas if we can develop and have some predictability, like an annual 5% or 5.5% or 6% increase, where it's much more predictable, it's easier for a school district to plan for that and to budget for that. So in the next slide related to that, you can see... Um, the dollars in that uh, rate stabilization fund, and you can see that it, you know, it sort of built up there in the first years on the slide. At that time, we were using um, Highmark's, what they call book of business, or their entire company um, um, premium increase rates. We started to recognize the trend of what was happening, and we went back to Highmark and said, you know, we're seeing this happening. You're, the, you're clearly increasing the rates more than they need to be because we're putting, at the end of the year, we're putting money aside into this fund. So they agreed to look at our consortium specific um, cost trends. And so starting in 2018, I think it was, 2017, 18, we started calculating our renewals based on those 11,000 lives that are covered within our insurance consortium. As you can see, we were able to, you know, there were some um, there was some suppression in terms of the premiums. So there were years that it called for a higher increase than we actually put in place as an effort to spend down some of that. Because again, it was relatively high. 
in 2022, we got to the point, 2022, 23, we got to the point where we had two months of premium um, in that fund, which is, it was the target. Um, Blue Cross doesn't want us to go below that. And so, again, now we're going, trying to get that strategy in place of sort of like using this fund as a, as a um, stabilizer if we, if we go with that like 5% each year. The next thing as we go down the list that I gave you is um, social security payments. Social security payments are uh, paid on a percentage of payroll, therefore the increase is there, just simply related to the um, fact that our payroll is increasing next year. The next item is retirement contributions. Um, we've used this slide now probably for the last uh, decade. To sh and, and really, I guess at this point, it's a little bit for nostalgia because we were trying to demonstrate you know, our rates in terms of premium, our, our employer contribution rates related to retirement contributions continue to go up. And actually, you can see over the last <coughs> two years or, or current year and projected next year, um, they've gone down. So uh, that's sort of a first uh, you can see in over the last decade um, and for next year, the employer contribution rates are going down 2.9%. Uh, um, however, while they're going down, while the percentage is going down, again, it's a percentage of payroll. And so as wages go up, it's, it, it's a multiplier to increase the um, retirement contributions. Workers' compensation is the next item on the list. Um, again, this is sort of an early estimate based on our total payroll and what we ordinarily uh, pay as a percentage of our total payroll. You may recall that ordinarily around May is when we have completed our um, insurance renewals and we'll have a better handle in terms of the overall cost for um, both the workers' compensation as well as the um, other uh, property liability insurances, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. The next item is other fringe benefits. Um, the reason you're seeing a decrease here is um, other fringe benefits include the retirement severance benefits that are paid out to employees at the point of retirement. Ordinarily, they're paid within the same fiscal year. So let's use this year, 23-24, as an example. People will announce their retirement. They'll be eligible for a retirement severance benefit, but ordinarily, it'll be paid out by June 30th. We had a unique situation well, I'll say this past year, the beginning of this year, where those people announced their retirement but didn't actually retire until after the new fiscal year. And so we knew that and we built in that expense in the in the 23-24 budget. Um, we are not aware of and we don't anticipate that to occur um, in this year moving forward. It could. We don't know that at this point. But that's why you see that reduction because we had budgeted something that we don't ordinarily see and now it's, um, you know, more than likely not going to be there next year. The next um, item is a special education allocation. And Dr. Campbell said she, in the middle of this, she would give me a little break. So she's going to. Yes. So you'll see here in the slide, um, just a reminder that the this particular expenditure slide does not include wages or benefits. So this is does not include personnel for our special education team. The projected increase in expenditures that we're um, proposing actually fall into two um, overarching categories. One of the areas in which we're seeing a substantive increase in terms of expenditures is in tuition for approved private placements. Several of those are residential placements. And then the other category in which we're experiencing substantive increases in terms of special ed expenditures is with our contracted, our contracted behavioral supports. And so those are, um, in most cases, actually, like services in terms of trained behavior specialists who um, are working with students with an IEP, and and those services are specifically outlined in the IEP process. I don't. Did you want to take the next one, which is curriculum materials as well? I don't have yes, a slide thank for you. That. But there's not a slide. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, on that slide seven, after special education, is an increase in expenditures for curricular materials that would support our existing program. So again, I'm going to provide the board and the public with an overview of specifically what those programs are. 
Um, thinking about our conversations regarding math earlier this evening, one of the increases is in the iReady math program. Those are instructional resources that support our math curriculum in grades K through eight and are used by all of our students. Another um, additional expenditure is for reflex math. Um, we talked about fluency. This reflex math is a resource that is specifically designed to help to target um, building students' math fluency, and that's used for K to, students K to eight. Another program, um, another additional expenditure would be related to FastBridge. So as you heard the high school go through their TSI data, you heard a lot about um, screening data in both ELA or reading as well as math. And so FastBridge is the universal screening and progress monitoring tool that we use for grades K to 12. And again, um, FastBridge is a program that we've been using. And so these are increased costs that we're seeing to maintain those existing programs. And then the final one is Lexia Core, which is a literacy or an ELA intervention that we're using for all students in grades six through eight, as well as currently our ELA lab for students in grade nine. And next year we would extend that resource, that literacy intervention to our grade 10 lab. Great, thank you. I enjoyed the break. Uh, the next item is the athletics allocation. Um, there's two things specifically within the athletics budget. That there's a lot of upward um, economic pressure, um, and that is uh, transportation costs, which I'll talk about in a minute when we get to the transportation line item, and the fees for athletic officials. Um, athletic official fees are uh, set not by the district, but by, I, I believe, the the um, probably PIAA. PIAA. Is it PIAA or I didn't know if it was the yeah. Anyway, um, so there's very little control we have over those, and so they have continually increased over the past several years, and so we certainly needed to address that within the athletic budget. Again, we'll talk about transportation in just a minute. Um, with regard to grant expenditures, um, the reduction here is specifically related to a grant that we ha had um, both last year and this year, it spanned two years, which was the School Mental Health Safety and Security Grant. Um, that grant ends at the end of the current year, and so that's you know basically removing the grant expenditures, um, and there was a offsetting um, reduction on the revenue side. Now I will say, um, Within the approved budget, uh, state budget for the current year, um, there, are, there is a mental health and a school safety grant, um, which again is another two-year grant. Um, most of those expenditures will occur next year, so we will actually see some expenditures plugged in here as we continue to develop the budget um, for those two grants. The next item, which is I have a slide here for, is the charter and cyber school tuition. Um, you can see that the trends, they've been mostly upward trends. Um, the green part of the bar, as you can see, is um, the expenses for regular, regular education students enrolled um, at those uh, cyber and cyber charter, charter and cyber charter schools. And the yellow is related to special education tuition. You'll note that um, you know, we were sort of like uh, moving along at a pretty steady pace until um, 2020, 2021, the effects of the pandemic, and we saw a fairly significant spike. The following year, we had a slight decrease, and now we're, we're again seeing an upward trend. I want to remind the board that with regard to um, charter school tuition, there's actually two components that make that up. And I'll just go to the next slide because they're on this slide. It's the enrollment. Um, so you, if you see an increased enrollment, you'll see an in increase in um, overall tuition. But it's also the um, calculated tuition rate. And there's both a regular education and special education tuition rate. Those rates are calculated based on each school district's individual financial situation um, on our budget. Uh, so there are 500 school districts in the Commonwealth. There are 500 different charter school regular education uh, rates and special education rates. You can see the increases in those rates over time. Uh, if you look at the tuition, I mean, it's been relatively stable-ish. Um, 
So really it's been the, the, the component that has been pushing the, our overall expenses up is more, more so the tuition rate um, than the enrollment in the last few years. The next slide just shows the increases uh, in the LCTI contributions over the last um, handful of years. And you uh, can see the increase um, projected for 24-25, which has been um, reviewed by our uh, LCTI board representative, um, as well as uh, is in the, on the agenda this evening for the board's consideration of approval. The uh, LCTI budget does include more detail with regard to those overall expenses. With regard to um, insurances, uh, just some quick history. Um, in 2018-19, we put out an RFP, actually in 2017-18, we put out an RFP for a new um, brokerage firm uh, to work with. We restructured, um, we restructured and, and said that we wanted somebody that we would, could, would partner with who wouldn't take the, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, What's it? The percentage. Of yeah, yeah. I, but my mind went blank for the, the name of that. Their commissions. Commission. They would. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> they wouldn't take the um, embedded commissions, and instead we would pay them a fixed fee for their services. Um, personally, I feel like they're more pure in coming to us and offering services and saying you need this, you don't need that. I don't feel like they're just trying to increase the services we're providing um, to to increase their um, compensation. Anyway, that was in 1718, effective for the 1819 year. Um, so you can see in 1819, they came in, we sort of stuck with the same program because they were coming in sort of late in the renewal game. And then you can see the significant impact that um, bringing them on had in 1920. Obviously, over time, insurance costs are going to go up. Um, so when you get to 22, 23, you see a jump there that was specifically related to the um, cyber. Uh, insurance marketplace, um, which we saw significant increases. That was sort of the um, post-pandemic. Everybody was online, and cybercrime became, you know, exponentially larger than it had been. Um, and then you can see an increase for 24-25. There was a little increase for 23-24. If you look at both of those, those are related to basically the inflationary pressures pushing the cost of everything up. So as property values are going up, insurance companies are saying, OK, well, if there is a claim, the cost of that claim is greater because inflation has driven the cost of things up. So essentially, we're seeing increases. I mean, the, the insurance marketplace is seeing increases because of in inflation and increased property values. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a much better handle on this in May, and certainly we'll revise um, the numbers in the budget uh, based on our actual renewal for 24-25. Um, Let me make sure I didn't miss any. Okay. The next one is um, transportation. Our current transportation contract expires at the end of the current year. We are currently engaged in an RFP process um, to evaluate transportation providers for uh, effective starting with 24-25. As we look at the responses we received, um, the, we know that there is likely going to be a minimum of a 20% increase um, in transportation costs moving forward. Um, we can, in fact, I'll probably just save that for when we do bring that to the board for, their, for your consideration of approval, but there's a number of factors, um, primarily the pandemic and some of the, um, you know, the, the, the transportation providers who didn't have, quote, business during that time, um, and so that affect them, affected them in certain ways. However, um, we're planning on a 20% increase for 24, 25, based on the information we have at hand at this time. The next item um, is debt service. And as I said earlier, uh, this first draft of the budget incorporates that um, um, the, the K to 8 option um, in terms of the initial plan that was put together. So on this slide, you can see the dark green represents our existing debt service costs. So you can see 
um, I think the last four years on the left side, including the current year. And then you can see the projections moving forward. So the light green then would be the new debt service associated with that. And so you see it sort of layered on here so that we have the total um, accounted for. And then um, sort of uh, interplaying with that, you know, we've talked, as I've talked to the board in the past, we've always looked at, okay, when our debt service came down, we were increasing our transfer to capital reserve to preserve the capacity to be able to pay for um, construction. And so the, capital res the use of the capital reserve also has um, a part in that overall um, funding plan or millage implementation plan. Um, the first year 20 of that plan, sorry, let me go back up. Year 24, 25 of that plan calls for um, a deficit or a use of $5.7 million of district reserves. Um, because of the types of expenditures that are associated with that for the year 24, 25, some of those are staffing expenses. Um, and other things that can't be directly funded out of the capital reserve fund. How we are going to accomplish that is reduce our contribution to the capital reserve fund for one year and then pay for those things out of the general fund. So essentially we're, we're withholding the dollars that we would otherwise transfer in order to use those in the general fund. And then the next year we will increase our contribution back up to the level that otherwise would have been. So you can see that's the case it's 5.7 million in 24, 25, and then a few thousand dollars is what's called for in that plan for the following years. So that brings us to the, the summary slide. Um, I'll go down the 24, 25 column. Um, you can see, if you recall from our previous presentation, total revenues of 186 uh, million, um, total expenditures of 195 million. We back out the budgetary reserve, uh, again, because it's, it's, a, it's for unanticipated expenditures. It's sort of a placeholder in the budget. So we come up with our anticipated expenditures of 186 million. At this point, there's no surplus or deficit, so it's considered a balanced budget. You can see the beginning balance. Um, we talked about that the last time um, of 23.6 million, and then uh, with a balanced budget, the ending fund balance would be the same, 23.6 million. And then finally, you see the um, breakdown of the fund balance at the bottom. Again, we went through those various categories last time, so you'd have an understanding what each of those means. Um, so with that, uh, that brings us to the end of the um, expenditure presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions there may be. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saul, for the detailed presentation. Uh, I'll open the floor to questions from the board. Ms. Klotz. So once again, Mr. Saul, you have made this easy to understand. Thank you so much for this presentation and all the hard work that you've done on this. Um, there's just two things, really. Uh, the group insurance, wow. I am so impressed as an insurance person <laughs> that there's that all of the administrative costs are offset by the pharmacy rebates, just, that's amazing. So yeah. really, just really good stuff there. Um, and the, actually, I can't remember what I wanted uh, to say about the other. No, um, the property liability and cyber insurance, that increase, um, that actually, doesn't seem outlandish to me. Um, I, from other colleagues in the insurance industry, I mean, we're seeing like close to 10%, maybe a little bit more. And also that you you were able to negotiate um, the provider not taking commissions. That's, I mean, that's amazing. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Hey, thank you, Ms. Klotz. Ms. Bowman. Um, this is a quick comment, and um, I really, it was just something you said made me think of it, and um, I'm not sure if I have the information quite right, so forgive me if this doesn't make any sense. But when you mentioned you were, um, it's time to look, renegotiate and bid out the bus contract, 
at some various points over the years, I've heard from parents who have wanted, I think but some bus companies have this app that lets parents know when the bus is late, when the bus is coming, things like that. Um, and I think our current company does not offer that. And so I'm just wondering if um, services can also be included as well as price, like if we can at least look for that service, because it's something that a lot of parents ask for. My only comment is um, this. Uh, we have received proposals that include things like that. They certainly come at a cost. Yeah. Um, I'm certain, uh, just like we, you know, we require a four camera system on our okay. on our buses. I'm certain if we require that, it's something that could be obtained, but it would be at the district's yeah. additional cost. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Certainly something. Thank you. We can consider as we work through the process, though. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Any additional questions or comments from the board? Well, I'd just like to make a few observations. Um, obviously, uh, you know, this is not unique to East Penn School District, but you know, things are increasing. Uh, so, you know, part of what, what, what's increased the, the expenditures for us is some of that natural growth uh, for things that, 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 that we're committed to do. Um, I think the question was asked before, uh, what, what part of the, the, the budget expenses are, are fixed, quote unquote? I think we said it was around 90% of the budget or are things that, that we don't necessarily have, have a lot of discretion over? I, I think that's a fair sort of okay. throw it out there kind of number. Do I, you know, I don't okay. obviously have it calculated, but yeah, I mean, okay. a very significant amount of, the, of a school district budget is fixed and or accounted for yeah. before we even start the budget. Correct. For we're we're all, yeah. essentially obligated to do it. So I think that's important to understand. Um, so again, a lot of the big drivers are obviously you know, the increase in, in the wages that, are contract that we're contractually ob obligated to. Uh, special ed is one is an area that I think is true for all districts where, where extra expenses are coming in. Um, transportation, as you mentioned, is also going to be another big driver for our, our expenditures and then obviously um, going into the district priorities, which we have yet to hear about, you know, there's obviously interest in, in maintaining you know, some of the things that we've been, that we've been holding with, some, with, with other funds and trying to build those into our budget. Um, so um, again, you know, I appreciate the, the detailed uh, presentation and look forward to the, to the next installment, call it. Uh, I forget. I think what we're we're going into. What was the next one? The next one will be the long, long range, range fiscal long capital range fiscal plan. plan. Okay, I really, yeah, that's, that's the really exciting one. That's the, <laughs> so if I can just make a couple of closing comments, sure. I apologize to go after you, but um, um, like Mrs. Klotz, now like that quickly it slipped my mind. Um, oh, I apologize. The I had skipped over the priorities as I was going through there, but I, Dr. Campbell did say at the beginning, um, we will have two board meetings dedicated specifically to the priorities where we will unpack those. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, again, I think you know this, but we're working through this as a process. And so we've, you know, we've talked about all the revenues, so you're familiar with those you know, sort of individually. We've talked through the areas of expenditure. The next thing will be the long range fiscal and capital plan, which you know, we sort of spoon fed you on the first two, but when you get that like that's that's like it's like drinking from a fire spell <laughs> um, there's gonna be a lot of information in there but but the first version of that you receive will still be based on the on the numbers that you've seen here again just so you can transfer the knowledge you've gained from these and then then we will start updating things and we'll start talking about okay here's the you know we assume this in the beginning but here's where we are state revenues expenditures those things so um, just bear with us. I mean, this is a process and we will get there, but um, we, we try to chunk it up. As you know, we've done this each year so that it's it sort of each presentation builds on the prior one. So thank you. Please put that long range plan as late as possible in the evening so that we can really truly <laughs> all the information. I'll be sure. Thank you. Great. Just thank to work. You. <laughs> That's an excellent suggestion. All right, again, thank you. Uh, if there are no further comments on that, we'll move on to the agenda. Moving on to personnel. Uh, we'll take these items separately. Uh, item A is the personnel agenda. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. 
Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Uh, item 6B is a, is a motion to approve uh, what we discussed at the last meeting about, about uh, hiring uh, safety and security personnel for the two middle schools. Mm -hmm. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any comments or questions from the board? Just a very quick question. Has the job description changed at all from when we were able to review it earlier? Re has remained the same. No changes. Thank you. All right, if there are no questions, uh, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, next on the agenda is business operations. Uh, if there are two items, uh, the second is informational, so we only have to uh, um, take action on the first. Item A, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Okay. Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Leggy? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, next item, uh, other educational entities. Uh, the first item is item A uh, for the East Penn School District to vote on the uh, proposed general operating budget for CLIU. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, Dr. Whitney, you have any prepared remarks? Uh, just about 30 minutes or so. No. <laughs> uh, no, I, I do not. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think I've, I've covered this a little bit in some yeah. of my reports. And, and yes, you have. Are there any questions for Dr. Whitney? Are we good with this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, seeing no questions, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, item C, the LCTI 24-25 uh, General Operating Fund and Academic Center Fund budgets. I um, may have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you have any comments? Uh, not, nothing additional to um, things that I've shared previously in the past, but if anybody had any specific um, comments or questions about the presentation that was shared with us by LCTI, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, there are no other items. Moving on to announcements. Uh, we did have an executive session this evening where we talked about litigation. Our next regular board meeting is scheduled for Monday, March 11th, uh, here in this room at 7.30 p.m. Uh, with no further business, I um, may have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you and see you in two weeks. Yeah.